Lately, I've been finding myself defaulting more and more to the Steam Deck and other PC handhelds as I try them out for where I play my games. There's obviously going to be those exclusive things that I like checking out on their home systems, but if it's a game that they're able to handle and maintain a smooth frame rate on, the benefit of being able to play on just a small sized handheld has always been a personal preference of mine. So I want to talk about a bunch of the games that I've been playing lately. There's a lot of great stuff that has come out this year. There's a couple older games that I've just been going back to and catching up on. Uh, everything that I'm talking about in this video is playable on Steam Deck specifically. Uh, not all of them are completely verified, but are at least playable. And obviously by extension can be played in other PC handhelds like the ROG Ally as well. And I want to start with Steam World Heist 2. Now this game released last week, but I've actually had a chance to play it a little bit longer than that thanks to the dev Thunderful Games sending me a review code. I also initially very first checked it out back at Summer Games Fest, and while I haven't been able to put quite as much time as I wanted to just yet, uh, every moment with it has just been wonderful. If you're unfamiliar with the first Steam World Heist, uh, this is a 2D tactical RPG. You have short missions that you run through using a small squad of characters, each of which has their own unique ability, and there's a class system on top of that, so you can customize them further based on what type of weapon they're wielding. Uh, and the entire idea is just running through these missions, trying to get the best score you can while proceeding through the game's storyline. And the combat in this game is just extremely satisfying. The way that you can intentionally ricochet bullets in a way to hit multiple targets or set off different traps, the way you can try to get around certain enemy defenses, the way that you can collect different customizable hats by shooting them off of enemies' heads, uh, all kinds of fun little details to how the combat works out. What works even better is how this interacts with the game's mission structure. While some missions can be very straightforward, there are a variety of different circumstances you have to deal with, uh, whether that's taking down a boss enemy or trying to escape an area, collect as much loot as you can, and all of them have this heavy focus on risk versus reward. Uh, there's always a simple, easy way to clear the mission if you want to play it safe, but there's always those extra little goodies around that you might want to take your time to try and collect that's going to slow you down and maybe cause some more problems, especially if waves of enemies keep showing up. Honestly, just an absolutely delightful game, and I think one of the biggest things it's really done for me is not just the fact that I enjoy it itself, but it's really opened my eyes to what I've probably been missing out on with the rest of the franchise that I now want to go back and check out as well. Riven. Now this name might sound familiar to some of you. Uh, this is a remake of a game that originally released back in 1997. It is a first person view point and click adventure. The original one was the old school approach of having these still frames that you would walk between. This one is actually full 3D motion. And if the name Riven specifically doesn't mean anything to you, you might have at least heard of the game. It's a sequel to Mist which missed for me was a formative game. That was one of those titles that I played very young, uh, young enough to where I really didn't actually have the best grasp of what I was really doing, but I was so entranced with the world that existed within it. Uh, and that experience extended into Riven when that released and I got to experience play that. I've revisited it a couple times over the years and having a chance to now play a beautifully remade version of the game with updated visuals and handles like a more modern title is just wonderful. I actually originally picked this up to test it out and try on the PSVR 2, and I was checking out the PC adapter for that. And that is a fantastic way to play it, but I've also spent some time checking it out on Steam Deck because the convenience of being able to just kick back and make a little progress here and there and trying to remember the solutions to some of the puzzles has been great. It is entirely focused on exploration and puzzle solving. I would say a large part of my love for it is like 80% vibe. Uh, the music, the sound effects, the atmosphere and the environments that you're exploring look, sound and feel incredible. And and the puzzle aspect is something that just keeps you a little more rooted in and throws a challenge in your way every now and then as you figure out how best to proceed. If you've had the opportunity to play the original versions of these games, uh, it is definitely worth taking a look at this remake to experience it in a whole new light. And if you missed out on the originals, I would actually recommend first check out the first game, which also got remade, Mist. It's a relatively short title, but the puzzle design, I think, has still aged very well. Uh, and it introduces you to what little plot this series has and helps set up for what goes on in Riven. Inscription. I know what some of you are probably thinking this game was a huge deal two years ago, and I did not talk about it until now. I'm a little late to the party on this one. I always heard amazing things, and I just didn't take the time to check it out until recently after picking up on a Steam sale. And yeah, it absolutely deserves all the hype it got. While I'm still making my way through it, I find myself being so intrigued with the game's approach to narrative, which I don't want to dive too into, because I honestly do think this is one of those games where it's best not to get too much described to in advance, and it's better to just dive in with as few preconceptions as possible. It is a card game, relatively straightforward, very much a boiled down version of what you might see from major trading card games like Magic. You know, you have 
creature cards that have attacks and defense stats. Uh, there's a whole lane system though, to where you actually attack only specific areas. Health isn't actually each person having their own health, but is instead a scale going back and forth. So big damage in a single move can have a massive impact, or it's entirely possible to go back and forth for a little while. The core gameplay and card mechanics alone are really good, but it absolutely is the package that it comes in, all the extra narrative stuff that again, I don't really wanna to dive too much into, but the way it just all comes together absolutely grabs your attention. Kunitsugami. And this is actually a game that I initially put more of my time on originally on the PS5, and then I ended up wanting to see how it would be on Steam Deck, because while I had a lot of fun playing on PlayStation, I began to feel like maybe this game would be a really good fit for having on a handheld, and I was correct. Full disclosure, this is a game I was able to play thanks to a code from Capcom, and is honestly, I think, one of the games that has been not talked about enough this year. Uh, partially because I think it's really hard to sell what exactly it is with just a trailer. And while the first couple stages and what you can play in the available demo give you the idea of how it plays it honestly doesn't i think paint the full picture of how much more interesting it gets in later stages as you begin to unlock more units with more interesting abilities there are different mechanics that get added in later like being able to pick different pathways to choose from that have their own unique challenges different parts of the environment to take advantage of uh, some stages deal with a light and darkness mechanic where you don't have full map visibility depending on where there are dark spots not lit up by torches it is a very interesting game and one of the more experimental ones to come from Capcom in quite some time, uh, which I am always happy to see. I have my love of big name major IPs. I'm always gonna look forward to things like the next Resident Evil or the next Street Fighter or maybe another Mega Man someday, but I'm so happy to see riskier, unique new stuff like this come out at the same time. While I don't think the demo does the absolute best job of giving you a full taste of what this game ends up playing like, that's more than absolutely nothing. So check it out, give it a shot, see if maybe you kind of like the ideas going on and whether or not you want to dive into the rest of the game because low-key, I think this is one of the better games this year that is just not getting talked about nearly enough uh, and just needs more eyes on it. Dread Delusion. This is a game that's been in early access and just fully released this year. Uh, in fact, I actually wasn't aware of it during the early access time. I just happened to find out about it right after it released. And so I dove in and gave it a shot. And if you were a fan of early 2000s computer RPGs, this is something you need to give a little bit of attention to. It actually walks this very interesting balance of something that has the feeling and look and style of RPGs from that era, but is also something a little bit more distilled, a little bit more simplified. It doesn't have a particularly complex skill or stat system. Making your character is a very straightforward process, uh, but what really ends up making this game, I think, stand out is not necessarily you know, creating your character, but just the world that you're thrown into. I've seen a few people describe this as something like Morrowind on acid, and that 100% makes sense to me as a huge fan of Morrowind. Not just because there's giant mushrooms, but just the entire idea of a game that has a fantasy setting that feels so much more unique from the get-go. This is not your standard forests and wolves and goblins type of thing. Uh, you're gonna be encountering all kinds of weird, strange monsters in a world that has a magenta sky. It's just one of those things where if you appreciate the idea of you know, a game taking you somewhere new feeling, this nails that feeling. You know, again, I think if you played a lot of games in the early 2000s and there's that aesthetic and feeling that comes with a lot of the first person PC games that came out back in that day, this really hits that feeling very well. But even if you don't have that nostalgia, uh, it is something different and interesting enough that still looks compelling in its modern approach that's gonna be able to make you a fan of it either way. Thank goodness you're here. Uh, this is a game that came out pretty recently. Uh, it's also quite short. I actually finished it up just the other night. And while it is not too much of a time investment in total, the time you spend with it is hilarious. I'm not entirely sure what genre I put this in. Maybe point and click. Uh, the entire process really is just you're running around town trying to solve different people's problems. Uh, and how much you enjoy this game is going to be very heavily reliant on your sense of humor. The game is just absolutely stuffed with ridiculous scenarios and hilarious dialogue. Uh, some of the comedy is very much just thrown right at your face and loud, and some of it is maybe a little bit more subtle and requires you to really pay attention to your surroundings or what's happening, uh, or might even require you to have maybe just a little bit of knowledge of some specific parts of pop culture and history to have the joke really land. 
And this comedy is just rapid fire. It is what absolutely soaks this entire game and is really the main point of it. I will say, while again, it is a little bit short and it's pretty easy to get through the whole thing in really just one good length sitting, there also appears to be quite a bit of little extra hidden things you can do as you play the game. Little bits and pieces you might miss, Easter eggs, that kind of thing, evident by the fact that while I have finished it, I am missing a decent number of achievements. And while I normally don't really feel like doing achievement hunting in games, given the fact that for this particular game, those achievements are tied to finding more funny little things to experience, I've been a lot more interested in actually doing another run and trying to find all that. Because it is comedy gold. Shin Megami Tensei 5 Vengeance. Full disclosure, this is another game that I was able to play thanks to a code, in this case, provided by Sega Atlas. And this is another game that falls in line with something that Atlas has done with a couple different games in that it is a bigger, better version of a game they previously released. In this case, the original SMT5 came out on the Switch a few years ago. But what's really interesting about this updated version is not only does it have a lot more content and additional stuff that is great, but more importantly, it opened up the game to a lot more platforms, not being just on Switch, but also on home consoles and PC, where I think the Steam Deck and other PC handhelds are a great place for it to live. Because since it was designed for the Switch in mind, which even on that system, it struggled a little bit performance-wise, uh, you're able to get something that looks even better on these PC handhelds while not having the same performance issues and really makes the visuals, aesthetics, and just everything about the game shine a lot more. Now, I will say as a longtime fan of the franchise, the original release of Five wasn't my favorite entry in the series. It was very good, just not my personal favorite. And there were a few aspects of it that I think could have just been tweaked a little bit and upgraded. And I feel like Vengeance is really hitting a lot of those notes. I have yet to fully finish it just yet, uh, but I really enjoy the new plot elements that have been added to this one. Uh, it just adds a bit of a different direction and tone that I really enjoy compared to the original version of the game that was released. And there's just so many other upgrades that I think make the entire experience feel better. Uh, not just the enhanced visuals from having it on a new platform, but changes in the music, uh, new moves you can use, a larger different number of demons you can recruit and use in your party. You know, while I can't lie and say that I always have a little bit of a mixed feeling with how often some of these major titles from the SMT and Persona franchise get re-released with more content, I can't deny that yeah, this re-release does add a lot of worthwhile content. And if you didn't have the chance to play it back on the Switch because you didn't have a Switch, the fact that it's opened up to more platforms is a great opportunity to dive in. And then last but not least, Hades 2. I feel like this one is super obvious. It also technically hasn't fully released yet, but the first Hades was my game of the year back in 2020. Uh, and Hades 2 is just a lot more of everything I loved from the first one. Chances are, if you looked at any of my PC handheld focused videos, Hades 2 probably props up somewhere because it's just a very easy game for me to dive into and have a lot of fun with right away while recording B-roll. It's just a game that I'm immediately in love with and already has a lot of playable content worth exploring, even though there is so much more that needs to be added as part of its early access journey. And there's a whole lot about this game where I feel like the big important difference between this and the first game is that it's just a remix on everything. You know, all the mechanics and the core aspects feel very familiar, but there's just a nice little twist in just about every area. Whether that's how the core combat controls have been updated and changed a little bit, how the weapon loadouts are different and might have some slight analogs to previous ones, but others that also work in much more unique ways. The way that there are some upgrades and boons that are similar to stuff from the last game and then whole brand new ones that introduce new mechanics. Everything just has, I think, this very well executed balance of something that feels familiar, but fresh at the same time. I can totally understand choosing not to dive into this game right away because it's early access and eventually there's going to be more content and more stuff. And there's going to be a complete version of the game, but there is honestly already so much to do in this early access version of it. Uh, you can hold off if you want to, but there's a lot of fun to be had right now. So there's just a whole bunch of games that I've been playing lately on PC handhelds. Uh, I think all of them are able to work wonderfully on the Steam Deck and even better on any other more powerful PC handhelds you might end up looking into or having on hand. I do want to once again thank Thunderful Games, Capcom, and Sega Atlas for providing the game codes for some of the stuff that I talked about in this video. Uh, all wonderful games along with everything else on this list. As always, if you guys enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button to let me know. Subscribe if you haven't yet, and I will see you all later.